So, welcome to uh, today's lecture on multiphase, where what we are going to do is uh, wrap up the uh, problem in some sense, not completely, slightly wrap up because the rest of the thing you guys will wrap up as a homework. And uh, what I want to do is just take you through the uh, process of finding the uh, base solution as well as the uh, first order solution, okay. And then uh, we will make some uh, observations and then we will keep moving. So, let us proceed with finding the solution here. The base solution remember corresponds to the problem when epsilon is 0. So, if our method is right, you expect that the base solution falls back, collapses to the flow between two infinite parallel plates, okay, the flat and that is exactly what is happening. This is the upper half is what we are looking at and uh, at y equal to 0, you have the no slip boundary condition and y equal to 0, you have the symmetry condition and uh, that is the differential equation which has to be satisfied and it, this is actually a total derivative it is not a partial derivative and you can therefore integrate it out directly, right. So, before somebody points that out, I let me just make this remark. So, now dw naught by dy, we integrate the differential equation differential equation twice and what do we get? w naught equals uh, minus y squared by 2 plus c 1 y plus c 2, okay. And uh, when I impose these boundary conditions, I have w 0 prime, w 0 prime at y equal to 0 equals 0 and this implies that c 1 is 0. When I differentiate this, substitute y equal to 0, I get c1 and if that has to be 0, c1 has to be 0. And from the other boundary condition, at y equals half, I have w naught equal to 0. So, I have um, w0 of y equals half equals 0 implies 0 equals half. So, I have minus 1 by 8 plus C 2 or C 2 is 1 by 8. And what this means is that W 0 is actually half of 1 fourth minus y squared, okay. So, that is my parabolic profile, that is my base solution and uh, I think that is perfect. So, what we want to do now is, we want to go ahead and construct the solution for W 1, okay. And remember, I need this information to find out W 1 and that is how it is, whenever you are doing a perturbation series, what you are doing is you are converting a problem into a hierarchy of problems, you use this information to construct the next fellow, right. And wh where does this information come in? This information comes in here. So, I need to calculate dw naught by dy at y equals half and this is evaluated at y equals half. So, basically what I am going to do is calculate dw naught by dy at y equals half and what is dw naught by dy? is minus 2y by 2 is nothing but minus y, it is nothing but minus half, okay. So, I substitute minus half here because this entire thing is evaluated at y equals half. Um, this is therefore, this evaluated at y is equal to half and dw naught by dy I have just found out is minus half, okay. I know w naught from my earlier solution. And so, this boundary condition basically reduces to w 1 equals 
sin 2 pi x divided by 4 at y equals half. The other fellow remains as it is. This guy w1 dash equals 0 at y equals 0. So, what I want you to observe is that now we have a homogeneous differential equation. Okay, this differential equation is homogeneous, the right hand side is 0, but the non homogeneity is in the boundary condition here. This boundary condition is, of course, homogeneous. If this also had been 0, if this also had been 0, what would have happened? The solution to the system of equations, this differential equation and this boundary condition would be the trivial solution w1 equal to 0. The fact that this guy is non zero gives me a non zero value for w1. Okay. So I'm, I just want to point out that this is non homogeneous and ensures w1 is not equal to 0. Okay. This is homogeneous. And this is also homogeneous. The other nice thing, of course, is that this problem is linear. Okay, there's no nonlinearity in it. So now the question arises: I have this guy uh, evaluated y equal to half, which is nice because I can now substitute this. Um, what I have to do now is remember that w1 depends upon both x and y. Okay. So, and if you remember the physical problem, the periodicity was in the x direction, the flow is in the z direction. Okay. So, one of the things that we can visualize is that this particular uh, velocity at the boundary is periodic, is possibly going to persist throughout the domain throughout y that is whatever is the periodicity of the ax the velocity in the z direction in the x direction that is this periodicity is going to be um, present everywhere. So, what I am saying is but w1 is a function of y as well. So, we seek we can uh, look for a solution of the form where w1 of x comma y is of the form um, some f of y multiplied by sin 2 pi x. Okay. That means the periodicity in the boundary condition prevails everywhere in the domain. See, I have fully developed flow, nothing is changing in the z direction, so the, the dependence in x and y. I mean, in the x uh, direction, if it is varying periodically at the boundary, I am just going to say that the same thing happens everywhere. Now, first of all, what does this mean? What I can do is whether this is correct or not or whether such a solution is possible or not, I can find by substituting this form there and see if I can actually get an f of y. Supposing I am not able to proceed further, that means this assumption is wrong. Okay? Then I got to come, come back and do something else. So, uh, that is one way to actually find out if this is indeed uh, possible. So, you know, you make an assumption of this kind, you proceed further, you get stuck, you come back and then you uh, make a change. So, clearly um, what we are going to do is we are going to substitute this here and um, what does this mean in terms of the differential equation? Let us substitute this form of the um, solution in this equation and I get d by L whole squared and d squared w1 by dx squared when I do it. Uh, I do a second derivative, I'll, I get 2 pi cosine, I get minus 2 pi again cosine, so I get um, what do I get? Minus 4 pi squared 
multiplied by f of y times sin 2 pi x plus d square f by d y square times sin 2 pi x equals 0. All I have done is substituted this form in my equation for w, okay. So, substitute w1. So, that is perfectly fine, okay. Now, remember, so what is happening is sin 2 pi x is present in both the terms that are present and sin 2 pi x is non-zero. So, you can actually knock it off. Supposing this had not been a second derivative, this had not been and your equation was actually with the first derivative, then such a solution would not have existed because on differentiating you would have gotten cosine and cosine and sine you could not have factored out, okay. So, the fact that I have a diffusive process, viscosity is actually, I have a second derivative process, I actually can uh, get this. So, that is something which I want to point out to you, okay. If it is a first order, if it is just convection, then this would not have happened, okay. So, this uh, sin 2 pi x is not equal to 0 and uh, Therefore, what I get is f double prime, which is that term, minus 2 pi, minus comes out, 2 pi d by L whole square f equals 0, okay. That is my equation for f. And what are the boundary conditions on f? I need to use these boundary conditions, w1 dash equals 0 at y equal to 0, there is a derivative with respect to y. So, f dash of 0 equals 0, okay. And I have w1 is sin 2 pi x and y equals half. So, if w1 is sin 2 pi x by 4, so this must be equal to sin 2 pi x by 4, I have f of y equals 1 fourth at y equals half. Okay, so at y equals half, w1 is sin 2 pi x by 4, so f, f of y has to be that, so f has to be 1 fourth. So basically what I have done, and uh, this is something which I want you to see because later on when we are doing other problems, we will be following the same strategy. We have started off with a partial differential equation and we are going to reduce it to a ordinary differential equation, okay. And that is… Uh, one way to uh, help find an analytical solution, okay. Um, we will see this in more uh, detail later, but basically there is only one periodic mode which is present in the system. Since my equation is linear, okay, I am looking for a solution which has only that mode, okay. If my solution were, uh, if my equation were non-linear, then the different modes could have interacted and I could have gotten different uh, waveforms, not just sin 2 pi x, I may have gotten sin 4 pi x, I may have gotten sin 8 pi x, okay. But because my equation is linear and I am giving this kind of a disturbance which is having a, a shape of sin 2 pi x, I am expecting my response to also have sin 2 pi x. But if my equation will be non-linear, I would have gotten other terms, okay. So, one of the things which allows me to do this is actually the fact that the equation is linear, okay. Now, this equation is something which uh, everybody can solve with their eyes closed and except me, all right. So, how do you solve that equation? I mean, you just seek a solution of the form e power mx 2 pi d by L, remember is a constant. So, seek f of y as e power m y and what would you get? You get the characteristic equation just as uh, m square minus 2 pi d by L, the whole square equals 0. So, m is plus or minus 2 pi d by L. Okay, and therefore f of y is of the form a e power 
2 pi d by L y plus b e power minus 2 pi d by L y. Okay? That is your uh, thing from uh, calculus whatever you learned. Now, I need to find a and b and if I know a and b then I can go back I know f I know w1 and that is what I wanted to get. So, how do you get a and b you have to use those boundary conditions. Uh, Let us use the boundary condition which is homogeneous which is f dash of 0 equals 0. Okay? So, f dash of y is a multiplied by 2 pi d by l e power 2 pi d by l y minus b 2 pi d by l e power minus 2 pi d by l multiplied by y that is f dash of y. Okay, I want to evaluate this at 0. So, f dash of 0 is nothing but a minus b times 2 pi d by l and this has to be 0 which means a, a has to be equal to b. This equals 0 implies a equals b. So, that is good I got rid of one constant and now I need to put the other boundary condition and get the constant. Okay? So, let us do that. So, from the other boundary condition, so have f of y is now therefore a equals b, right? So, a multiplied by e power 2 pi d y by l plus e power minus 2 pi d y by l. Okay? So, what is the funda now? f of half is one fourth. I have to evaluate this at half. And uh, so, one fourth f of half equals one fourth equals a multiplied by e power y is half, right? Pi d by l plus e power minus pi d by l. I am sticking to exponentials because I think people are comfortable. You got to work with hyperbolic functions as well. So, that tells me what is a. I can use this to get a, I can go back and substitute it uh, back here and uh, get the, this thing. So, this implies that a is 1 by 4th of e power pi d by l, e power minus pi d by l. Okay, and f of y is therefore a So, you can just observe that this is cos hyperbolic okay? and you will get cos hyperbolic and this also I can convert into cos hyperbolic so that the factor of 2 which comes they get cancelled off with the definition of cos hyperbolic. So, this is 1 fourth of cos hyperbolic 2 pi dy by L divided by cos hyperbolic pi d by L. Okay? That is what we have. So, this is w1 for you and now you have found the correction to the velocity to the first order because now w is w0 which is your parabolic profile plus epsilon w1. You should similarly go ahead and find w2. Okay? Again you have a homogeneous equation, Homo one of the boundary conditions is homogeneous. The boundary condition, one boundary condition will be non-homogeneous, but for this boundary condition you need the information from W0 and W1 and this information you would use to uh, go find a solution. Okay? And uh, uh, just one last observation before we proceed further. I want you to uh, realize that W1 is going to be of the form 1 by 4th cos hyperbolic. 2 pi d by l y divided by cos hyperbolic pi d by l times 
sin 2 pi x. Now, like I had mentioned earlier, one of the things we are interested in finding out not only is the actual velocity profile, but to find out if there is by uh, having these kind of corrugations, is there any change in the flow rate which is passing through the channel, okay. You can look at flow rate per unit wavelength because you have an infinite channel which is extending to infinity in the x direction of this periodicity. So, it makes sense to concentrate on one wavelength here and through the gap of d and see what the flow rate is. So, how do you find the flow rate? You would find the flow rate by taking this velocity and integrating this out in the x and y direction, okay. So now, what you are going to observe is that when you have, since you have the dependency and the solution is of a variable separable form is some function of x multiplied by a function of y. So, when you want to integrate this out in the x and y directions, you would be able to integrate this out in the y direction, you would be able to integrate that out in the x direction separately, okay. When you do this integration out in the x direction, you are going to see that this is periodic and therefore, sin 2 pi x when you are integrating from 0 to half or minus half to plus half because you are looking at the whole channel remember, okay. So, uh, so in the x direction from 0 to l, sorry, in the x direction is from 0 to l, in the y direction is from minus half to plus half. Here it is from 0 to l, you will find that this guy is not going to make any contribution. So, what this means is that because this is going to go to 0, this integral will go to 0. So, what this means is as a first order effect, there is going to be no change in the flow rate that you are going to see. If you want to go to the second order effect, which you have to go because that is a homework problem, you will find that it is going to make a difference to the flow rate. So, the flow rate is going to be affected only at the second order, okay. So, point I am going to make here is um, at order epsilon, the flow rate is uh, not affected since integral 2 pi x, oh sorry, sin 2 pi x and if I am working in dimensionless coordinates is from 0 to 1, okay, equals 0. At order epsilon squared, the flow rate will be affected and that is something I am telling you, I want you to prove uh, to yourself and uh, that this is indeed true. So, you, all, all you need to do is find what W2 is, um, what you will find is that the x dependency is in the form of a square, okay, uh, maybe sin squared or cos squared. So, it is when you integrate it out, you are not going to get a 0 value. Okay, and uh, you just need to solve again the same procedure, same uh, process. So that's uh, the part. So this is the part which has been wrapped up, and this portion you guys have to wrap up. I think uh, I just want to make one more remark that the domain perturbation method is extremely important when it comes to solving stability problems. I think it's kind of the basis for solving stability problems because. Now, remember now, I had a flat surface and I gave a small perturbation which was periodic and then I was able to actually construct solutions, okay. So, when we are talking about multiphase flow problems like the problem of the jet breaking up into drops, okay, what do you have? You have a cylindrical surface which is your base solution without any uh, uh, epsilon in it, which is defined as r equals r naught, which is constant. And now you give a small perturbation, which could be periodic, and then you're going to ask the question: Is this perturbation going to uh, make the uh, jet break up or not? So you, you can see now we are actually interested. Whenever you're talking about multiphase flow problems, where there's an interface, and uh, the base state is normally going to correspond to uh, boundary which is like y equals half, but when you give a perturbation, it is going to be y equal to half plus some perturbation, okay. So now, when you want to find out whether something is stable or unstable, you need to therefore use the domain perturbation method that we just spoke about to actually do the calculation. 
So that's where all this thing is fitting in. I'm just trying to tell you this to show you that whatever we are doing here is actually fitting in. So the first part of the course, we just did a small uh, revision uh, of um, some of the concepts you've learned. And we extended it to the boundary conditions when you have actually an interface which is not uh, necessarily corresponding to a coordinate axis. Okay? And I told you how to find the normal stress and the tangential stress when you have some surface of the form y is equal to f of x. That's because when I'm going to actually solve a problem, I'm going to be using normal stresses or balancing, tangential stresses or balancing. Okay? Not stresses in the x direction, not stresses in the y direction. It is the normal stress and the uh, tangential stress. So that's what we use. Then we came to a perturbation because this is going to be basically the uh, starting point for stability. So let me discuss a little bit about stability and then what we will do is we will start solving some uh, problems in stability. Okay? So uh, with this, uh, so perturbation methods is just uh, to give you some insight about how you can convert a nonlinear problem into a bunch of linear problems. So you remember that viscous heating problem was actually non-linear because you had a du by dy whole square term. So but when what we did was we converted it to a bunch of linear problems and then we got an analytical solution. Okay? So that is one of the things we are going to do when you talk about stability. So let us quickly jump into stability. Okay? So, first of all, I want to clarify that when we talk about stability, we are talking about st uh, stability is with respect to a state of the system. What does this mean? People normally talk about stability of a system. This system is stable, this system is unstable. Okay? But what I am saying is you should talk about stability of a particular state, maybe a steady state. So if you have a steady state, you have a system where which let us say has a steady state like you have um, a laminar flow in a pipe. That might be the easiest example. Okay? So if you have a laminar flow in a pipe, and let's, uh, because we are doing a multi-phase flow, we start with single phase, then we go to multi-phase. So laminar flows is a steady state of uh, the flow in a pipe. Okay, it is always a steady state. What, what does this mean? You um, can calculate the uh, like earlier uh, on today we found out this parabolic velocity profile. Okay, this parabolic velocity profile was dimensionless, so it, it did not have this g and all that the pressure drop, but otherwise it would have had a pressure drop. So no matter what the pressure drop is. That is a solution to the equation if you have a flat plate. You understand? So what I am saying is the parabolic profile profile is always a solution to the governing equations. Do you all agree with me? The parabolic profile earlier did not have anything, it did not have the pressure drop because it was scaled inside my velocity. But if I actually write it in terms of an actual velocity, the dimensional velocity, I would have had a pressure drop just like your Hagen Poisel equation. Hagen Poisel equation has some dp by dz. So if I give a very small dp by dz, I have a very low velocity. If I give a large dp by dz, I have a large velocity. Right? So basically, what this means is it's always a solution. However, you all know that for Reynolds number less than 2100, only you will have the laminar flow, which is going to be experimentally observed. When Reynolds number is more than 2100, the flow becomes turbulent. Okay? 
And so what is this uh, critical thing about 2100? So that means that what I'm doing is just visualize an experiment where you're actually increasing the pressure drop. So there's a parameter in your uh, problem as an experimentalist which you can actually change, okay? So you are doing an experiment where you keep increasing the pressure drop. So let us say that you have a pressure drop which corresponds to Reynolds number of 100, which gives you a flow which corresponds to a Reynolds number of 100, okay? So we have a delta P which gives a flow corresponding to Reynolds number equal to 100. What does this mean? I can, given a delta P, I can find my velocity profile. I can find my average velocity, right? I can go back, I know my properties of the liquid, I know the diameter of the channel, I can get rho VD by mu and you do this calculation, you find Reynolds number is 100. So what does this mean? You can actually, when you're doing this experiment, you will actually see a laminar profile. So whenever you're doing an experiment, remember that your experiments are always going to have some disturbances, okay? I mean, when you... Uh, do an experiment, it's not possible for you to perfectly control your pressure drop. It's not possible for you to come perfectly control your flow rate, okay? There will always be some small disturbances. If you are able to observe this laminar velocity profile, then it means in spite of these disturbances which are existing, in some kind of a time average sense, you are able to get your laminar velocity profile, okay? So that what I'm trying to tell you is that any system, there will always be some small disturbances present, okay? But it turns out that these disturbances are decaying to zero. They don't get amplified as long as the Reynolds number is less than 100. But su suppose, you know, you slowly increase the pressure drop and let's say Reynolds number is 1,500. Again, you will see laminar flow. Again, there will be disturbances that are present. Okay, and again your system is stable. But supposing you change the pressure drop a little bit more and you cross the threshold of 2100, your flow becomes turbulent. What is the difference? Your laminar profile is still theoretically a steady state. Okay, but there are some disturbances which are going to be present, but now the disturbances are getting amplified. The disturbances don't decay to zero. And because the disturbances don't decay to zero, you would uh, get a turbulent state. You understand? So what we are talking about, so, so what I say is the laminar flow, the laminar profile is stable. That's a steady state solution. The laminar profile is stable for Reynolds number less than 2100. The laminar profile is unstable for Reynolds number greater than 2100. Okay? So I'm talking about stability in the context of a steady state. So that's how you should always talk. You, know, you can't say this the system is unstable for uh, more than 2,100 or less than 2,100 is stable. You are talking about stability in the context of the steady state, okay? So um, what I've, I've done is I've introduced the concept of stability in the form of small disturbances, which are always going to be present in an experiment, okay? So now let's say we have a delta P which gives, let me write, uh, write down a few things. We have a delta P which gives a flow which corresponds to a Reynolds number of 100. In any experiment, we will not be able to have perfect control, okay? There will be some small deviations. Okay, I'm talking order epsilon. So now you know. So very small deviations, let us say of order epsilon, where epsilon is very much less than one. And the question is, how does the system respond to these disturbances? So, see, if you, ha you have a pump which is pumping a liquid, okay, there's going to be some small fluctuation coming in at the pump. So, it's not that your pressure at the outlet is always going to be whatever, 5 bar, uh, 10 bar. 
although it has a possibility of uh, you know uh, it has the rating of 5 bar uh, at the outlet pressure maybe it's actually going to be slightly varying 5.0001 to 4.999 okay so that that is my perturbation the question is so say for example the pump outlet pressure is uh, say rated at 5 bar but it could vary from 5 plus or minus epsilon clearly it's not going to be exactly 5 bar and if somebody is telling you it's going to be exactly 5 bar and you believe him you're crazy right so there's going to be some fluctuation and depending upon how much money you're paying how accurate the pump is the epsilon is going to be smaller and smaller okay so I'm saying that this epsilon is my disturbance the inlet pressure but for Reynolds number less than 2100 these disturbances are deviations in the inlet pressure dk to 0 in the fluid okay that's how the dynamics is when you actually solve the partial differential equations and you are actually trying to find out whether this kind of a deviation of pressure from phi to phi plus epsilon okay uh, whether it's going to make any difference or not dk to 0 in the fluid if your Reynolds number is less than 2100 but if the Reynolds number is greater than 2100, the uh, laminar flow becomes unstable. And we have turbulence and there's something you all know so I just wanted I mean you guys have uh, possibly mugged something up and said oh Reynolds number less than 2100 laminar but actually what is happening is when you're actually ch crossing you're having a stability problem okay what was stable has become unstable and the way I want you to visualize the stability problem is that there are these small fluctuations always going to be present and uh, what happens is for less than 2100 these deviations uh, dk more than 2100 the deviations get amplified and you have turbulence remember the laminar flow is a possible solution for Reynolds number greater than 2100 okay the parabolic velocity profile is possible so what I'm saying the point I'm trying to make here is the laminar flow is always a possible solution or is a possible state possible steady state in fact there are people who have done experiments very very carefully and they have been able to observe laminar flow up till uh, Reynolds number of 10 power 5 okay so if you really were interested in this you could do very very careful experiments and see that when you have Reynolds number of as high as you know 100,000 you would get laminar flow but then uh, normally if you are not very careful you just have a regular uh, pump you are doing an undergraduate lab I mean people are uh, possibly uh, trying to cut down on costs so you just will get this transition at 2100 okay so the uh, I'm just trying to tell you uh, how do I know this uh, careful experiments reveal that laminar flow can be seen at Reynolds number up to 10 to the 5 okay so 
all this means is that we are talking about a steady state now and my steady state is my laminar flow profile. So this laminar flow profile is stable, I am going to call it stable for Reynolds number less than 2100. It is unstable for Reynolds number greater than 2100, okay. So the laminar flow is stable for Reynolds number less than 2100 since the disturbances dk to 0, okay. And the laminar flow is unstable for Reynolds number greater than 2100 as the disturbances now get amplified. So this is something we are always going to do when we talk about a stability problem. When we talk about a stability, stability problem, what we are going to do is we are going to worry about changing some parameter which you can control as an experimentalist and you are going to find out how does the system behavior change, how does the response to disturbances change when you have uh, one parameter which is being varied. So just like we have done now, when the noise number is low, when disturbances are present, they are going to decay everything is fine and stable. When uh, Reynolds number is higher and that is the parameter I am changing, okay. The parameter I am changing is the flow rate or the pressure drop. So density, the pipe is of course the same pipe, so diameter is constant, fluid is the same, density and viscosity are the same. The velocity has to change for changing the Reynolds number. I change the velocity by changing the pressure drop, okay. And as you keep changing the parameter which um, is the inlet pressure, you will find that above a critical threshold value which in this case happens to be 2100 for Reynolds number, you have a change in the behavior. So what was stable has become unstable. So that is what I have written down here. So the stability is always talked in terms of responses to disturbances, okay. So you, what you do is you have a particular steady state and the steady state would normally correspond to what in my perturbation method I had as the zeroth order solution. Okay. We did uh, perturbation series now, usually I have a zero order solution for which I know the solution like I had the parabolic profile for the laminar. Then what I do is I start giving disturbances and uh, whatever I am talking about experimentally, I have to do it using my model to find out what this uh, threshold is. So what we are going to do is we uh, d determine stability. Uh, in terms of the response to a disturbance, okay. And uh, ex experimentally, if you are actually able to observe a particular state experimentally, you can conclude that that particular state is stable. I mean, without any doing anything special. You are actually able to, because why? Because there be disturbances are always going to be present when you are doing an experiment and if you still see that particular steady state, that means the system that, uh, is ensuring that the disturbances are decaying to 0, okay. So any experimentally observed state, as long as you have not done something to control it, okay, to, to make an unstable system stable, if you have not done anything special, if you are just uh, letting a system run, okay. And if you observe it experimentally, then that particular state is stable. So any experimentally observed state is stable as this is seen in the context of uh, in the presence of disturbances so what we are going to do in this course is 
trans try and transform this simple experiment which you are comfortable with into a mathematical language so that we can make a prediction of these threshold values okay so what we want to do is we want to convert this to a mathematical framework to be able to predict the onset of instability in different contexts especially in the context of multi phase flows okay that's the whole idea